Okay, our sermon text this morning is going to come from Genesis. Genesis, uh, three chapters in Genesis, a few verses from each chapter. 12, 1 through 3, 15, 1 through 6, and 17, 9 through 14. This is God's word. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram. I am your shield, your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward the heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. And he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. I'm actually going to continue reading through 15. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from the earth of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when the birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nation that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a good old age, and they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying to your offspring, I give this land. From the river of Egypt to the great river, to the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. In chapter 17, God said to Abraham, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you, throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in your flesh an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. The word of the Lord. Yes, Let's pray. Father, we pray that uh, in this we would not see merely uh, an academic exercise in understanding uh, the sacrament of baptism, but that we would see uh, your grace to your people throughout the generations uh, from Adam and the grace that you showed to Adam and Eve uh, through to Abraham and all the way up to our days, you show grace to us through Christ. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Well, as I said, we'll be discussing uh, baptism this morning, and the easiest place to start is with Abraham. Uh, Abraham, or Abram as he is called at first, uh, was a distant relative of Noah. And you'll remember that Noah and his family were saved from the flood that wiped out all of humankind. Ham, Shem, and Japheth uh, were his sons, and they all emerged from the ark and began repopulating the earth. Shem 
uh, from where we get the word uh, Shemite or Semite uh, related to the Jewish people. Had a bunch of descendants, and the last important we descendant we read uh, about from Shem is Abram. Abram was born and raised in what we today would, be, would call Iraq. Uh, uh, the faith of Noah had not been passed down throughout the centuries, uh, so, uh, so he and his family worshipped the pagan gods there, uh, most notably uh, uh, the most important of which was Nana, the moon god. Uh, Abram was a wealthy man. He had lots of sheep and servants, and he was minding his own business, when one day God came and spoke to him. And I want you to notice, as we think about Abram and what all went on with him, just how one-sided God's dealings with him are. Uh, oftentimes in Scripture, when God comes and speaks to someone, we get a lot of information about the person being spoken to, right? They, 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 uh, uh, they fall down as dead, or they uh, say they can't bear to have God uh, come and speak to them. They're terrified and what's going on. But here in Genesis 12, and uh, you know, these, these first nine verses, uh, God's giving his instructions to Abram, telling him what to do and where to go. Uh, Abram says nothing. Uh, in fact, uh, the first dialogue that we have between Abram and God is not until chapter 15. So there's this big chunk of, of God's sort of initial coming to this uh, moon worshiper in Iraq, uh, saying uh, you need to leave everything that you have and go somewhere else, uh, where all we hear is, is, is God's voice being spoken. Uh, and so uh, we see Abram uh, responding, we see him uh, reacting and accepting on faith that what God said was true, but we don't see uh, we don't hear his words. We see God's action. And what God is up to here is the next phase of redeeming a people for himself. Uh, Abram didn't know this, but the reason that he existed at all was because of this thing called the covenant of grace. It's a term that, uh, that we use to describe the covenant that was given, uh, that was announced in the Garden of Eden. Remember when Adam and Eve sinned? Uh, God is actually speaking to the serpent, but he says uh, a seed's going to come. Somebody's going to come from the woman someday who's going to crush the head of the serpent that deceived you. So uh, for a long time after that, it looked like the serpent was winning and leading the whole world into sin. God sent the flood, as I said, saving Noah and his family and making a covenant with Noah, saying that he would never destroy the world again that way. Uh, the covenant with Noah is what, something we call an administration of the covenant of grace. Uh, it's a way of applying it. Because God had said that someone had come to crush the head of the serpent, he made this covenant with Noah to continue that promise. Indeed, the world would not be destroyed before that one, the Messiah, would come and defeat Satan. So now God comes to Abraham and brings that covenant forward, that covenant of grace and he comes to make it official with Abram. He told Adam and Eve, a Messiah is coming. Now he tells Abram, the Messiah is going to come from your family. Uh, not just, a, it's a, he goes through a, sort of a general uh, comment to a more specific, here's how this is going to come about. In fact, what was announced in the garden becomes uh, really so much more expansive. Instead of, Someone sometime will come. It's, I will make you a great nation. I will make you a blessing, and you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Notice God's not doing something different with Abram. He's not telling Abram something different than he told Adam and Eve in the garden. He's expanding on what he said in the garden. What was very general in the garden now becomes more specific. It becomes more clear. This is how God unfolds his revelation uh, throughout Scripture. We see uh, in shadows and we see in, in seeds what eventually become clear realities and become uh, 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 full-grown trees in the New Testament. And likewise, there are two phases of the fulfillment of the promise to Abram. 
and what God is doing with Abram, how he was speaking to Abram, there are two phases of the fulfillment. The first phase of fulfillment is the promise of a land, a physical land, and a physical people. The second is the promise of heaven and Christ. Packed into this covenant with Abram is everything that's going to happen in all of redemption, uh, redemptive history from there on out. You'll notice that in this covenant, God promises to give him a piece of land and to make him a nation and to bless all the nations through his offspring. And yet, we see that this covenant goes way further than that. We don't really see it in Genesis, but Hebrews helps us to understand that Abraham wasn't just looking for a piece of real estate on earth. He was looking for a heavenly city. He was looking for that second phase of the fulfillment. If you read through Hebrews chapter 11, you'll see that the faith that all the people had there wasn't merely looking for something on earth, but looking for something permanent, something God built. So 11.16 says, But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. But not only that, the promise that God made to them, to those people then, would not be complete until we were included. We being all those who believe after Christ came. As it says in Hebrews 11.40, since God had provided something better for us, that apart from us, they should not be made perfect. So there's a promise made about the land, and there's a promise that is also there that looks beyond to a heavenly land. That land promise was fulfilled under Moses. The covenant with Moses was the first phase of that promise. And the people gained, the people did gain all the land that was promised to them. Joshua 21, 43, the Lord gave to Israel all the land that he swore to give to their fathers. And they took possession of it, and they settled there. But God had more in store for the world than just a piece of real estate. Because to Abram, he had promised an offspring as well. This promise, this offspring promise, also has two phases. Just like the land has two phases of a physical land and a heavenly land, uh, the offspring promise has two phases as well, an offspring of nations and another offspring. And Paul tells us in Galatians who this offspring was. In Galatians 3.16, he says, Now the promises were made to Abraham, and to his offspring. It does not say, and to offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. So what do we have here? We have a promise to Abraham that he will inherit a heavenly land, and that Christ himself will come from his body. How much of this Abraham, Abram understood, we don't really know. But we do know from the New Testament that he knew there was more to it than some real estate and an earthly nation. I also need to point out that all of this was to be believed by faith. Genesis 15, 6, he believed the Lord, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Note again, Abram believed, but it, God counted it as righteousness. Abraham's righteousness did not gain these things for himself. But the righteousness that God imputed to him, put to his account, declared as his, as he believed by faith. So to sum up what's going on with Abram, you have a promise of a heavenly city, a promise of a Messiah, and these things are not just for the Israelites, but for the whole world, if they will simply have faith believe. This should sound very similar to what we believe as well. Righteousness imputed, put to our account by faith, which gives us Christ and his heaven. What Abram looked forward to, we look back on. Abram looked forward to Christ. We look back to Christ's life and to his finished work on the cross. Both we and Abraham by faith Trust the promise of salvation by Christ and the hope of the world to come. This is important, and so I'm going to say it again, 
What did Abraham believe? He believed in Christ and the promises of the gospel. What do we believe? We believe in Christ and the promises of the gospel. Abraham understood it less than we do, but his faith in Christ was no less than ours is. Now notice that all of this is God redeeming a people for himself. He is making Abraham into a great nation. That's why God changed his name to Abraham, father of a multitude. Remember the common phrase all throughout the Bible, I will be your God and you will be my people. He's making a people. He's gathering a people to himself. And there's that phrase that keeps coming up over and over again throughout the Bible, I will be your God. You will be my people. And as we talked about in Leviticus in our study there, we had to ask the question, how is that possible? How is that going to happen? How is it possible for a holy God to live with sinful man? We saw that the only way this was possible was with bloodshed. So we see in the covenant with Abraham two bloody signs that go along with that covenant as God advances that promise to be God to us and for us to be his people and for him to dwell among us. So we have two phases of the covenant. Now we have two signs of the covenant. The first is in Genesis 15 that we read a little bit earlier. In order to show Abraham that he would keep his promise, that everything he said would come true, he had Abraham perform what was actually a very common ritual in those days. People would often make a covenant by cutting an animal. And in fact, every time you read in the Bible where it says, so-and-so made a covenant with somebody else, the word made there will have the, the Hebrew word behind it will be cut. You always cut a covenant because there's always an animal that dies in the process of making a covenant. So you don't really make a covenant, you cut a covenant. So God told Abraham to take a ram, a goat, a cow, a turtle dove, a pigeon, and cut the big animals in half. He would take the halves and set them opposite each other, creating a blood-soaked path in the middle. Ordinarily, the two parties who were making the covenant would walk between the animal pieces to show the fact that if either person failed to keep their terms of the covenant, then that person would end up like those animals, cut, dead. These covenants were no joke, what they made back then. They promised death for the one who kept, failed to keep their end of the deal. So we expect to see God and Abraham walk between those animals together. And we would further expect that we'll soon see Abraham fail to keep his covenant, his side of the covenant, to be destroyed for uh, not uh, holding up his end. But God does something amazing here, of course, right? He puts Abraham to sleep. And while Abraham's asleep, God walks through those pieces. He does it himself. God's saying, I'm not only going to keep my side of the covenant, I'm going to keep your side as well. This would require nothing less, ultimately, than someone fully human to keep Abraham's side and to fully God to keep God's side. It's one of the most beautiful pictures that we have in the Old Testament of Christ. Christ who came and kept both sides of the covenant and yet also suffered the bloodshed that was required of humanity for failing to keep the covenant, and yet is fully God, one who is able to fully obey and do all that God required. Isaiah 53, 7 says, He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth, like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. This leads us to uh, another point in, in, when we think about this, the second sign of the covenant. Christ was cut off. As it says there, he was cut off out of the land of the living. That word there means divided. 
He was cut off. He was divided from the land of the living. Of course, in Abraham's time, this was yet to come, but God wanted to put a permanent marker on his people so they would remember the covenant. So God made another sign in the bodies of every male who lived in Israel, the sign of circumcision. I won't go into much detail about what circumcision was, but it involved cutting off a part of a male, both adult and child. Since the original covenant of works was made with Adam, and it was another Adam that would come and save the world, and since this new covenant was being made with Abraham, the sign was placed in the male body. Circumcision was a sign of the covenant, showing that fulfilling the covenant required bloodshed. It also was a continual reminder that man would fail to keep his side of the covenant. Man's blood would be necessary, but only, ultimately only the shed blood of Christ would be effective in fulfilling this covenant. And the sign of circumcision also reminded them of God's promises. If you refuse the sign of the covenant, you refuse the promises of God. So every male, eight days old and up, would need to be circumcised. Everyone in the camp would need to take the sign of the covenant. Anybody who was, uh, even, even people who were uh, uh, traveling and staying with the people of Israel, if they were going to live there, they had to take the sign of this covenant. Whether or not they were any sort of believer, there was no exam that came before it. It was simply, if you're eight days old and up, you take the sign of circumcision. Of course, in the case of a baby, you couldn't know if they believed. In the case of an adult, even because they were a member of the visible people of God, of the church in that day, they would need to take the sign of the covenant as well. So what does all this mean for us? We've already seen that we, along with Abraham, look to the same thing for our salvation. Abraham saw it in shadows. We see the reality. Abraham looked forward. We look backward. The sign of Abraham's covenant was bloody, but the sign of our covenant is actually bloodless because the final blood has already been shed. What circumcision points to in blood, baptism points to in water. And these two signs, circumcision and baptism, are connected in the New Testament. Listen to Romans 6, 4. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Baptized into his death. His death, which cut him off from the living. His death was his circumcision, as it were. We don't need to be circumcised because the thing circumcision points to, Christ's death, has already been done. And yet we are united to that circumcision. We are united to that death by baptism, by being baptized into the death of Christ. Colossians 2.11, In him you also were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. So united to uh, him in baptism, uh, through baptism, we were united to his death. But of course, neither circumcision, just like circumcision didn't uh, do anything of its own power, baptism doesn't do anything of its own power, but rather the Spirit has to work through both of those things, had to work through circumcision in the Old Testament, and now baptism in the New, the Spirit has to work to give us faith, to believe that these things are true. It tells the one that is baptized that you've been set apart. Excuse me, baptism is, is, and baptism is a sign of that. It points to it. It tells the one that's baptized that you've been set apart by God and for God. It tells the person that if you believe the promises of God, that those promises are true for you. Circumcision didn't save anyone. 
but it identified those who were in the visible church. Baptism doesn't save anyone, but identifies those who are in the visible church. Baptism is the beginning. It's the beginning of a life of faith and discipleship. For the adult, it looks back to uh, the, the, those who are, um, it looks back to what Christ has done in them by uh, working faith in their hearts. For the infant, it does a couple of things. It reminds those of us who witnesses, witness it that God has called this child. He's put this child in the visible church, the covenant community, and will be repeatedly calling her to himself through the preaching of the word and the lives of those around her. And it's a witness to the child that they have a special place in life. They've been placed in the visible church, and they should believe the word that is preached to them and express that faith as soon as they are able. See, really, baptism is God's work. It's not something where we are coming to God and bringing to him our faith. It is a sign of God's promise. It is something that God is placing on that child. It's a call to discipleship. And it shows that there is one way that God has always dealt with his people, by faith in Christ.